Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for the first event in our Riverwatch Winter Speaker Series. Um, for all of those who are new to the Illinois Riverwatch Network, um, Riverwatch is a citizen science organization that trains volunteers to monitor water quality in their own communities. The mission of Riverwatch is to safeguard the future of Illinois rivers and streams through stewardship, education, and sound science. Before we get started, I'd like to ask everyone to keep their microphones muted during the presentation to limit any distractions. Uh, if you have any questions for our speaker along the way, um, you can either put it in the chat box or just save it yourself. And, and if you would like, you can ask questions aloud during the Q&A session at the end of the talk. And with that, I would like to welcome Katie Zeke. Um, Katie is an Environmental Programs Associate with the Heartlands Conservancy. Um, she works with team members on environmental initiatives, uh, as well as on projects that support resilient communities initiatives, including watershed planning, education, outreach, and environmental planning. Um, prior to joining Heartlands Conservancy, Katie ran a science laboratory at St. Louis Community College, where she taught classes in biology. And she also spent time working in the fisheries division of the Missouri Department of Conservation. Um, so with that, um, I would like to welcome Katie and turn, turn all of this over to her. Thank you, Dr. Hake. Okay, I'm gonna just stop my video here. Okay, as Dr. Hake said, um, I am the Environmental Programs Associate for Heartlands Conservancy. Um, I do a lot of supporting work for them um, as well as work in community resiliency and watershed planning, which is what we'll discuss today. There we go. <laughs> so Heartlands Conservancy's mission is to conserve, connect, and restore the natural and cultural resources um, that sustain the people in southwestern Illinois. We were formed, the Heartlands Conservancy was formed in 1989. We are the largest conservation organization that serves the greater Southwestern Illinois region. That includes counties of Madison County, St. Clair County and Monroe County, as well as the exterior counties um, surrounding that region. We work with natural systems uh, to support our mission. And a lot of those natural systems are things like floodplains and the farmlands and prairies the wetlands, the open spaces, cultural sites of the region. We believe that everybody in southwestern Illinois deserves access to high quality open spaces as well as clean water and clean air. So to support that mission, we have three umbrella programs, um, land and water conservation, resilient communities, and engagement and education. I'm gonna briefly discuss the land and water conservation as well as engagement and education, and then I'll segue into the work that we do under resilient, resilient communities, excuse me. So we own 1,000 acres of preserves. Um, we have 30 conservation easements and we help manage four additional sites. This culminates to about 10,000 acres preserved region-wide. Examples of that include Engelman Farm in Shiloh, Illinois. One of our new acquisitions is Kathleen Scanlon Conservation Area along the Kaskaskia River, which conserves um, hardwood bottomland forest as well as wetlands. We also co-own uh, White Rock Nature Preserve along the bluffs. And of course our lovely Pogue Sand Prairie in Edwardsville, Illinois, which um, provides critical habitat for the endangered chorus frog. So we do engage the community as much as possible. Um, and yes, we've still been doing some engagement work with the communities through COVID. We take people out on treks and hikes. We do paddle treks with the community and um, we will engage people in bio, blitz, bio blitzes, such as birding bio blitz or butterfly bio blitzes. We host something called the Metro East Tree Week, which we will be hosting again this year during Arbor Day and Earth Day. Uh, that really engages the urban communities to plant trees and um, also replace invasive species such as Bradford pears with um, native species. 
We help manage a urban garden, a community garden um, called the Belleville Heart Garden through our Lots of Love program. And our third program is regional resiliency, and that really entails comprehensive planning with cities, as well as watershed planning, which is what I'm going to discuss today. And through watershed planning, we're also able to implement ecological restoration and green infrastructure. So to understand a watershed plan, you really first have to understand what a watershed is. And a watershed is simply an area of land that drains water to a common water body. You can think of it like a bathtub almost, um, where every drop of water that hits the area flows to a common drain, in this case, a river. Um, everything we do on land impacts the water that goes into the river. And all the major watersheds in the continental United States with the exception of one, the Great Basin watershed, drains to the ocean. So for the most part, everything we do on land that affects our rivers not only affects the folks downstream of you, but it will eventually affect the ocean as well. Heartlands Conservancy has developed watershed plans for nine watersheds within the region, as you can see here on this map. And a lot of those watersheds have common goals. Um, it's important to note that every watershed is unique. They will have their own goals, their own objectives, and their own issues that we have to um, problem solve for. However, the past few watershed plans that I've worked on have had um, the priority goals were improve surface water quality as well as reduce flooding. And then four supporting goals, which is promote environmentally sensitive development, support healthy habitat, develop organizational frameworks, and conduct education and outreach, which are all equally important to achieve um, the first two goals, which was improve surface water quality and reduce flooding. Every watershed plan has um, three main components to it, and that is the watershed resource inventory, the stakeholder engagement and community outreach, which is an ongoing process, and then the watershed plan document itself, which is a cohesive document that pulls all of that information together and then provides professional recommendations as well as action plans. So very briefly, the watershed resource inventory is just a dense document that identifies all the resources in the watershed. And that includes the biotic and abiotic factors that influence that region. And that is simply the living and non-living components of the watershed. So non-living being the climate, the geology, aquifers, etc. The living being the fish and wildlife populations, the people. Um, and we also, you know, put together all the information from the National Flood Insurance Program communities, the 303D list of impaired waters, and other water quality data that's presented to us by um, partners such as NGREC. Stakeholder engagement and community outreach is an ongoing process. It's, it begins at step one and it continues on even after the plan is adopted. We put together something called the flood survey, which is a very important document, um, gives us a lot of information about flooding in the watershed. We have a technical, technical committee and advisory group. We have open house events for the public and continued stakeholder meetings throughout the process. So the flood survey gives us a lot of information. Um, for this watershed, I believe this is Paisal Creek watershed, um, we were able to ascertain that flooding occurred on average once per year, culminating in almost $12 million lost um, in the last 10 years. We also found that 93% of those floods occurred outside of the floodplain. And we also um, identify the causes of flooding. And in this watershed, the four top causes of flooding have been heavy rainstorms, lack of drainage facilities, sewer backup, and flooding from nearby rivers, etc. One of the things that is good to note about this is that at least two out of four of those causes are things that we can manage, things that we can provide solutions for. So that's at least some good news about that. We also find out things like respondents value um, water management. They value their clean drinking water. They value preventing flooding. And they also value the ecosystems that they live in. So that's also good news that we get from these surveys. 
Here's an example of uh, stakeholder engagement. This was an um, advisory group meeting that helped plan, you know, some of the projects going forward and identify some of the areas uh, that might need some work. And then here's an example of a public open house event where the community can come in and identify on hard copies of maps where these problem flooding areas exist or where they may know of a project being implemented. After we get those preliminary data um, sort of resolved, we go on to develop what's called critical areas. And critical areas are simply existing causes of pollutants that are significantly worse than other areas, or there's a significant potential to make progress towards the watershed plan goals. And the areas we identify are stream reaches, riparian areas, wetlands, flooding areas, and log jam areas. An example of a critical area that is an existing cause of pollutants that might be worse than other areas would be something like critical flooding areas. An example of um, a critical area that can make significant progress towards the watershed plan goal would be something like critical wetlands because wetlands are one of the most effective BMPs or effective tools we have for cleaning our water. So simply critical areas are just high priority areas for best management practices, which I will discuss um, in just a little bit, but critical areas are generally identified through the watershed resource inventory in the past, we've done aerial and field assessments where we've actually had a helicopter fly through the watershed and over some of the streams to identify the stream reaches as well as log jam areas. We use flood surveys to identify um, critical flooding. We use what's called the agricultural conservation planning framework, which helps us identify critical wetland areas. And then we also look at stakeholder and community engagement to further ID problem flooding areas. So after we've identified what our critical areas are, which are high priority areas for us, we also identify and pull together information on what the point and non-point source pollutants and issues are that exist in the watershed. Uh, more often than not, the issues are non-point source, which simply means there's more than one cause for this pollution in the watershed. So we cannot just point to one source of um, phosphorus. It's gonna be multiple different things causing phosphorus loading into the stream. And you can see over here just an example of what some of those are. Sediment, total phosphorus, nitrogen, fecal coliform. They extend to things like dissolved oxygen, manganese, barium, etc. And um, while some sediment and some phosphorus is natural and okay, uh, you can see here that the average in this watershed for sediment was just over 104,000 tons per year. Well, we have a target amount of a 20% reduction. So this is how much we need to reduce from the watershed. Um, and then here it just says, you know, high sediment loads means that the water is murky and that can harm aquatic life as well as reduce dissolved oxygen and increase temperature in the waterways. So some examples of those watershed health issues are things like critical riparian areas. You can see here, um, that's where there's no riparian zone or the agricultural field goes right up to the uh, stream bank. And this is harmful to the water because when you have no vegetation here, the soil doesn't stay in place. So deep rooted vegetation such as trees or tall grasses physically holds the soil as well as slows the um, surface runoff. It also provides a lot of habitat for the aquatic wildlife. It provides shade relief, etc. And then of course things like debris and litter are not just unsightly, they also can be dangerous in the water and they can also leach toxic chemicals into the waterway. And over here um, on the right, things like goalie formation cause um, property damage as well as erosion, which is also dangerous. Other examples like critical log jam areas. A log jam is simply um, a debris blockage in the stream bank. So some log jam areas are actually good, um, but 
a lot of them aren't. So this would take something like a field assessment to really identify if the log jam is something that needs to be removed. But they can cause erosion and increase sedimentation, which also increases phosphorus loading to the stream beds. If they ever become dislodged, they can be dangerous downstream to other people. And then of course, flooding on private property causes property damage. It can um, remove loose items and take it to the stream bed as well as leach toxic chemicals into the waterway. So after we've identified what our issues are, what the pollutants are and what the critical areas are in the watershed as well as what our goals are, we have to tap into our toolbox. And our toolbox utilizes what's called a best management practice. And that word is loosely applied to multiple different things. But for watershed planning, we utilize what's called a stormwater best management practice. And that is very simply a structural, vegetative, or managerial practice used to treat and prevent water pollution. And then beyond that, we also utilize um, some of our computer models to identify these BMP types as well as locations. And for our purposes, we have used what's called the spreadsheet tool for estimating pollutant loads, or STEPL for short, a BMP siting analysis, and agricultural conservation planning framework. I want to note here that there are numerous models that can be used for this kind of work. These just happen to be what we have used in the, in the past and certainly what I have used for the past few watershed plans. So very briefly, the stepple is just a really nice um, dense uh, Excel calculator where you can put in numerous different variables based on the conditions that you know, and it will give you a lot of outputs about BMPs in the watershed as well as pollutant loading in the watershed. This is an example of what uh, the output would be from a stepple. It really shows you, you know, the sediment loading in the watershed. If you want 20% reduction of sediment loading, you need to have 20,000 tons per year of sediment removed. In this case, by the year of 2035. It gives you lots of different data that we can tap into to understand what we should be implementing across the watershed. It also gives us this nice table where we can identify what the best management practice is for that land use type. So here's agricultural management. Here are the different kinds of best management practices. And then it gives us a recommended amount that we could apply and how much sediment or phosphorus or nitrogen would be removed if we applied that much um, best management practice in the watershed. It's also important to note here that not all of these best management practices are going to be feasible. Um, these are just, this is just a toolbox that we can use to tap into um, for watershed management. And from there in our plan, we are able to pull together a nice table called the target reduction table. And this just identifies for the reader what the impairment is in the stream. So for in this example, um, phosphorus which is harms water quality and aquatic life. The basis for that impairment is that 185,000 pounds per year of phosphorus is loading to the stream. We want to see a 25% reduction based on the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy. So that would equate to 46,468 pounds per year of phosphorus removed by 2035. Um, and then over here, it just breaks it down on how much we should be removing of these areas in the watershed. So for example, we should be removing 2,200 pounds per year from the critical stream reaches and so forth. And we can do that if we apply best management practices throughout the watershed. So some of the best management practices that we use for urban settings are things like bioswales and street trees and detention basins, replacing sanitary sewer lines and deep rooted vegetation. There are numerous different BMPs for urban settings and other land use types. So this is just a snippet of what some of the ones that we um, use are. So you can see here a vegetated bioswale. This is right off the road and right along a parking lot. And this will slow stormwater runoff as well as allow the pollutants to infiltrate into the ground. 
And then things like porous pavement, which kind of speaks for itself. It allows the water to filter into the pavement and thereby reduce flooding. Detention basins can hold stormwater runoff. These are great for places like new neighborhoods where there's an increasing, an increased amount of impervious surfaces. Storm drain cleaning is incredibly important as well as store, uh, street sweeping for municipalities to adopt because storm drain cleaning clears those storm drains of debris. So it reduces the amount of storm water that gets backed up into the street in a major rain event. And then of course we have um, single property flood reduction strategies such as rain garden and rain barrels. Um, I do want to note here that rain barrels work best when multiple people are using them or you have more than one. However, they also provide water for you to water your garden with. So they conserve water as well. One of the tools that I use to plan um, for potential locations of stormwater management um, BMPs in urban areas is what's called the BMP siting tool. It used to be hosted by the EPA. There are numerous models out there now that um, can help do this work, but I found this matrix to be the easiest one to deal with in a GIS framework. So this is the one that I've been using. It identifies different urban management measures and gives um, the variables that are needed for that management measure or that BMP. So you can see here infiltration basins require a soil group that's either A or B. Um, so that would be a limiting factor for that uh, BMP in an urban setting. Again, like grass swales work best when they're uh, within 100 feet of the road or the parking lot. And so this is an example of what um, the output of that might look like. These are three different best management practices for an urban setting, an urban watershed. And you can see this is for grass swales. There's a lot more dry ponds that are recommended. Um, if we were to include parcel data, this would change significantly. And then something like porous pavement, you can see um, while it is an urbanized watershed, porous pavement would not actually be best suited for a lot of the areas due to the soil type and the um, slope of the watershed. So these really provide a starting off point for stakeholders and municipalities to go in and look and identify where uh, BMPs could be located. So some of the best management practices we use for agricultural areas includes things like wetlands, comprehensive nutrient management plans, water and sediment control basins, filter strips, um, conservation tillage, grass waterways, etc. There are numerous ones of these as well. So this is just a snippet of some of the ones that we tap into. And you can see here an example of a water and sediment control basin is just gently sloping fields that seek to um, slow the surface runoff and reduce the amount of organic pollution loading to the waterways. You can also see something like cover crops, which not only hold the soil, the topsoil in place, they can also slow the surface runoff um, on top, as well as replace much needed biomass back into the soil. Bioreactors, which serve to break down organic pollution, contour buffer strips, terraces and grass waterways all seek to convey as well as slow um, the stormwater runoff and the surface runoff on the field. And then of course, the wetlands, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the most effective best management practices that we have. Um, they, this is Arlington Wetlands and Pontoon Beach. This is a property that's managed by Heartlands Conservancy. Um, they store a lot of water and they are wonderful at filtering the water. And one of the things that people also don't realize is while they, they clean and hold our water in the region, they also work wonders at scrubbing our atmosphere of carbon dioxide. So wetlands are truly a, a wonderful BMP that we should really focus on implementing as much as possible. I believe there's less than 10% of the wetlands remain in the region. Um, so the more that we can implement, the better off um, our communities will be in the long run. And I read a study recently that said wetlands in the Midwest are 40% 
more effective at scrubbing the atmosphere of carbon dioxide than wetlands on the coast, coastal regions, which I thought was an interesting tidbit about them. So one of the um, models that we use to plan for agricultural best management practices is what's called the Agricultural Conservation Planning Framework, ACPF for short. Um, this, the conceptual basis for this is to build soil health first, to control water within fields, then below fields, and then lastly, to have riparian management. So these are examples of the output of that model. Um, you can see wetlands across the Piasaw Creek watershed, water and sediment control basins, and then contour buffer strips. There are other um, <clears throat> BMPs that were utilized for this model that are also recommended. And then some of the best management practices we use for lakes and streams, things like log jam removal, as I said, that's just a debris blockage, shoreline stabilization, stream bank and channel restoration, and very rarely lake and stream dredging. Um, these are largely just identified based on critical areas assessment and stepple, and then of course, field assessments. So some examples of those, um, you can see here shoreline stabilization um, this seeks to slow the weight, the force from the wave action, so it keeps the banks from eroding away. Um, here's some stream bank stabilization with riprap. And then uh, we, you can see here riparian restoration using trees and deep rooted vegetation. So after we've pulled together all of these BMPs and these professional recommendations, um, the next steps in the plan are to really identify action plans for the communities. And this is where we work with partners, um, places like NGREC, who can provide monitoring plans uh, for the water quality and what the municipality's next steps should be. Um, we also go forth and start applying for funding for these BMPs. One of the things I really want to reiterate or to um, really state is that it requires a suite of best management practices across the watershed to see significant improvements. So um, the more diverse the best management practices we have that we can tap into, the better off the watershed will be and the more resilient the communities will be in the long run. And the watershed plan is the starting off point to start building these resilient communities and the benefits of healthy watersheds are numerous. Um, one, the economy will flourish because you're, you're providing jobs for the community. And you're also preparing for population growth and you're attracting people to your community to come live there. Um, you're preparing for rapidly changing environments and climate. You're providing clean water, you're mitigating flooding and the costs associated with those, and you're also providing sustainable agricultural solutions for the future um, generations. So thank you for coming to this discussion, and if you have any questions, I will take those now. You're on mute, Dr. Hake. <laughs> All right, thank you, Katie, for that presentation. Uh, I turned on my video and forgot to uh, to unmute myself. <laughs> That's okay. So, yeah, as, as Katie said, if you want to go ahead and you can unmute yourself to ask questions, or if you would prefer, you may type them in the chat. Um, I'll go ahead and get started, though. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about log jams and and you know because I. I always think of log jams as a way to kind of slow down the movement, which can prevent stream erosion. Um, but it sounds like uh, you're you're promoting clearing those. So I'd love to know more about that. Yeah, log jams is definitely going to be one of those um, that's going to require field assessments. Um, absolutely, that is not something we're going to be able to identify as um, needing to be removed just based on our com uh, computer models. But there's oftentimes log jams that cause erosion and cause flooding upstream when they get too thick or too dense. So those are gonna be the kinds of critical log jam areas that we need to pay attention to and possibly remove, especially if the goal is to convey the water downstream to keep it from flooding the neighborhood or the region that surrounds that area. Okay, 
Um, and we have a question in the chat from Faye. She's asking, uh, what is the link for the Step L website? You can find that on EPA's website and you can download it and play around with it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun calculator, so I recommend it. <laughs> Great. Uh, okay, if I ask a couple of questions. Go for it. Uh, what sort of monitoring of pesticides do you do? What sort of monitoring and what? I'm sorry. Of pesticides do you do? Um, I, we do not do any monitoring of pesticides. That would probably be a question better suited for um, NGREC. I have never monitored for pesticides, but it might be something interesting. Is, a, is it part of your watershed planning? Uh, it, if it's an identified pollutant, it would be, but I have not seen it in the past three plans that I've worked with. And I guess the other big question that I know that everybody has to deal with is, do we have enough money? Right. <laughs> so that's the next steps. After the plan is officially adopted and all the stakeholders agree to sort of what's in the plan and what's in the document and what's recommended, um, the next steps beyond that is to begin applying for funding. And I know our organization taps into the EPA's 319 funding because they do a lot of green infrastructure implementation and um, that those are sort of the next steps that we take. Uh, one of the things I might mention is University of Illinois prepared a very detailed evaluation of different types of green infrastructure. And that's a worthwhile read because they evaluated it across the country, some of which are very effective, others are, le are less so uh, for it. Um, the, I guess the last question that I have is what do you do for bioassessment? How are the fishes and uh, critters doing? So bioassessment, a lot of that is done through, in the past plans that was done through NGREC, through River Watch volunteers, I believe, were the ones that were out there getting biotic um, assessments completed, as well as water quality data. Any fisheries work that's done as part of your as part of your? Uh, uh, not not through Heartlands Conservancy. If there is, we'll pull that data from the other organizations that um, do it. Okay, um, I'll, so real quick, the, a comment from Faye asking James if you have a link for the uh, the U of I study. If so, maybe go ahead and put that in the chat. Uh, oh, and, and then there's I'll, also- I'll have to get that for you later. Uh, okay. But, uh, yeah, it is available uh, uh, to folks and uh, represents what uh, the University of Illinois prepared the study for the state. Oh, okay. So the state of Illinois wanted to evaluate the efficacy of different types of green infrastructure. And that, and that study was done at U of, U of I. Um, and uh, some of the comments concerning it were, were very, very valuable in, in doing it. I'll look to get that to you probably tomorrow morning. Okay, yeah, so, so Faye, if you wanna email me, I should be able to hand that off um, to you. Sure. All right, and then there was another question from Cassandra. Um, what can you do as an environmental scientist for corporation assessments? Do you have any tools to help mitigate the certain effects of these projects? Um, corporation assessments? I'm not familiar yeah. with that term. Do you mean like a corporation wanting to, uh, you know, do their own assessment on their property or could you, um, right. Elaborate um, on that. Yeah, Cassandra, if you want to elaborate, um, you can either unmute or or put it in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I I would guess that she's probably speaking about um, just the when a whatever assessments a company has to do. It looks like she's unmuted. So. Yeah, I was just asking as far as you know, like with the company I work at, we have to make delineations for wetlands and. There's, you know, corporations are gonna start stop building. So, is there a way to like? Is there any good resources um, to help tell, like, you know, make that plan for corporations because they're gonna build, and unfortunately, we all know that. Um, but is there anything that we can do, like, 
that you know of as far as tools or like websites or something um, just to help, you know, educate those companies when they're going to build anyway. Do they do um, an environmental impact assessment? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we do. Um, but I didn't know if there's anything else that we could do because they, like a lot of times, you know, they, we kind of get overridden. Um, right. So it would be a matter of uh, collaboration. Um, it would definitely have to be in part um, coming from the company, especially if they're within their legal right to build, if they're following all the permits and codes and laws and everything. But it would, you know, we would always be willing to provide recommendations on how to mitigate certain environmental damages that might be caused, as well as how they can build utilizing green infrastructure around their space. Um, so we have never done it for a company, but we have done these plans for um, small cities, as well as for entire watersheds, as well as for counties. So it just really depends on who is seeking the plan and what um, they're wanting to do, essentially. Someone that was, you know, in that field, they could contact you guys and just kind of talk to you about it and absolutely. see what you guys have done, like with other companies. Or yeah, companies. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, our project manager is very knowledgeable in what our organization can do, and um, and certainly our CEO would be able to answer those questions too. So, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it looks like Sharon was trying to, to help clarify that. Uh, she, I think she was, and, and Sharon, please let us know if I'm misunderstanding. I think you were trying to clarify the um, NEPA and the environmental impact statements portion of that. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, okay. Yeah, I do, David Cookmeister. I just got a quick question. Um, what the 319 grants that you were looking at, well, then Trump, former President Trump, cut a lot of the EPA money for those grants? Yeah, I'm not, I know that there was a lot of politics at play with the EPA under the former administration. Um, I cannot tell you how that impacted our ability to um, get approved for funding for some projects because I came in on the last half of the fiscal year. So I did not actually apply for any of the funding for any of our BMPs. Um, going forward, I still have no idea <laughs> what the impacts are gonna be on the EPA. I hope good. So I'm, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say about it because I have no clue. And um, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I apologize. <laughs> I was just curious. Well, okay. I have a, uh, oh, okay. Here's another question from Espo. Yeah. Um, for, for those of us who are not in your Southern region, what is a good place to secure funding for stabilization projects? I would start with the EPA. Mm -hmm. Those 319 grants, um, those are funding green infrastructure projects such as like stabilization and water. I would start there. Um, and hey, start Katie, you might mention that the 319 monies come through US EPA and then they filter down to the state and the state administers. Them. Okay. So the, the availability of those monies in the future probably will be, be larger than it is currently. Mm -hmm. And I, I have, uh, hopefully, a last question. How do you deal with impervious cover? Impervious surfaces? Impervious cover, yeah, the, the issue of it. And are you familiar with all the work that the Center for Watershed Protection has done concerning that issue? I am not familiar with their work. Um, impervious cover is that would be largely something that we deal with in the urban watersheds. And right. that would be something we would try to manage through um, retrofitting BMPs. We encourage, of course, new development, um, include these BMPs in their development because it's easier to build with green infrastructure at the beginning than it is to go back and retrofit things, so. 
Okay, um, and then to follow up on Espo had kind of a follow up question of if it's federal or state, and and I think that was kind of what James was pointing out is that the so the the funding for the three nineteen is U.S. EPA funded, but when you're making an application, you apply at the state level. So, um, and then Paula commented that they have filed for three nineteen funding for the past four years and have never received it, but they're hoping to do better this year um, by delineating more specific projects usually a good way to go on grants. <laughs> That's, I've noticed like with our grants, like the 319 grants, it's always been in the past six months that I've worked for them. It's always been for very specific infrastructure projects. Like this project is going to be implemented and this is why we need it to be funded. Not, it, it's not a vague or broad scaled thing, so. And Espo is asking, for a watershed with over 95% agricultural land, what do you feel would be the best, best management practice as a starting point? I don't know. <laughs> I'll definitely look at the agricultural uh, BMPs that, you know, I, I pointed out to in my PowerPoint. Um, we encourage farmers to do things like cover crops and conservation tillage because it not only helps with the surface runoff and the pollutant loading, it also conserves our topsoil for crop production. And then of course, things like the um, WASCOBs and nutrient management plans. Um, as a conservation organization, it's easy for me, people like me to jump in and say, you guys need to put wetlands in your field, but that's removing crop production. So um, it's, it's just kind of, dependent on the farmer and who you're working with. Um, maybe if there's some sort of collaboration or network, you can start with the farmers and their fields to um, see what they might be willing to do. Yeah, I've, I've always kind of been under the impression that the best, best management practice is the one that the landowner is willing to do. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever they're willing to do, <laughs> yeah. as long as it's good. <laughs> Is, okay. is, is channelization very common in your watershed? I, I, could, I didn't get to read all that. Okay, uh, okay. so for uh, Espo is following up. Uh, so we need to have the entire scope of the project spelled out before we can apply for funding. Is that correct? And then great answer for the last questions. <laughs> I would say um, as spelled out as you can possibly be. Not to say that it can't be adaptable and that certain things can't change as the project gets implemented, but um, they need to know that the money that you might be receiving from them is going to be spent in a very specific way for a very specific project. So. Definitely the more detailed, probably the better. That's what I've found in the past anyway, with a lot of things, so. Okay, and then Sharon adds that in St. Clair, buffers and grass waterways would be my first step given plowing that goes to the very edge of roads, streams, et cetera, and plowing through drainages within the fields. So that was just, I think, a comment. And then Espo says, thank you. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll add a question kind of from a, a very different perspective, and, and I'm not asking this to put you on the spot, but more so because it's something that I've kind of been working on myself. Um, and so I, I always like to hear the perspective of other, other people who work with, um, with watersheds about things like this. Um, so I was wondering if in, in the watershed plans, um, in the planning process, if there's any special effort made to engage a diverse section of the of the population in that area, um, specifically thinking about like environmental justice communities because people who don't tend to have much money don't to tend to have the power to say, I don't want this in my neighborhood or they can't afford to live in a safe, healthy neighborhood. They can afford to live in a place that's maybe more ecologically contaminated. Yes, so a lot of what our organization strives to do is um, be involved in the environmental justice component because 
environmentalism is really all about environmental justice. <laughs> and that that is just true across the board. And so one of the things we're starting to tap into more is um, watershed planning and resilient communities in St. Clair County. I don't, as you can see, we haven't actually done anything in St. Clair County. A lot of our funding has been through Madison County, which is why all of those watershed plans are in those regions. Um, but we're hoping to tap into St. Clair more where they have a whole set of unique environmental problems and things that need to be solved. And um, it's going to be, it's going to be a Huge, like just the whole thing is going to be about getting the community involved and understanding um, what's going on in the watershed. It's going to take a lot of research, um, but that's kind of what I'm hoping to be able to do. I, I started in this organization in August, so that's the direction I want to go. We are located in Belleville, so <laughs> it makes sense that we <laughs> do more work in St. Clair. So yes, we do Absolutely, we do take into consideration environmental justice and getting the diverse populations involved. All right, any other questions or comments for Katie today? Oh, here we go. Um, can the grants uh, or can the county I live in also apply for these grants or the municipalities that are in the county? And if this is referring to the 319 grants. I think so. I don't know. Would that be a conflict of interest because they're two government? I have no idea. <laughs> I imagine I'm, they should be able to, but like oftentimes there's partnering organizations that have to be involved and all that. So right. um, I'm, I'm fairly certain from, from my previous work, unless it's different in Illinois than in other places where I've worked, um, I'm fairly certain that um, municipalities, counties, um, and non profit organizations, and I think also educational institutions. I believe those are all eligible for that grant. Um, it should be pretty easy to look it up when they have their, their request for proposals. That'll be one of the, one of the main um, headings is who's eligible. Yes. Okay, well, I think that, that seems like we're, we're out of the questions. And so I want to thank First off, Katie, for speaking with us today. This was very informative. Um, thank you for having me. That, and then I uh, also want to thank all of you for coming. Um, oh, and we got, a, we got another one from Faye here. Uh, doesn't the Illinois EPA now require developing an EPA portal, which had a number of auditing requirements that may be tough for small outfits? I've never heard of the EPA portal or auditing requirements. So I'm so sorry, I do not know. Okay. I imagine that's something that we could easily look up. Um, I don't know, I apologize. <laughs> All right, I thank think, you very much. I think that Chris Davis is the person at IEPA that handles 319 grants. And that might be a good start for anybody that's looking to find out information about it. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, Thank you all very much for attending tonight. And I hope that we see you next time. I believe our next um, winter speaker series event is on February 1st. So coming up very soon. Um, so if you want to join us again, we look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, especially. Thank you. <laughs> thank you and good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night. Thanks.